Hello and welcome to Civic Cocktail. My name is Whitney Keyes and I'm the Executive Director of Seattle City Club. And we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year, recognizing the lasting vision and impact of our founders who worked to ensure that everyone had access to civic information and elected officials with the power to impact our region and our democracy. I happen to be in Volunteer Park in Seattle's Capitol Hill District. And as we begin this program, I want to acknowledge and respect that wherever you're watching from, the land was called home by many other communities generations before you. And as part of Seattle City Club's ongoing diversity, equity, and inclusion work, we respect and value the tribal history of our region, and we're committed to reflecting native voices and expertise as we strive to create more opportunities for dialogue across differences in our programming. I also want to recognize the ongoing patterns of discrimination, hate, and violence that exist today and that have had the impact on American, Asian, and Pacific Islander communities recently. Seattle City Club is committed to doing all we can to bring light to these issues and stand against racism. Our Civic Cocktail Program is just one way that we do this work, and I want to thank our presenting sponsor, Comcast, for its generous support of our mission and its longstanding commitment to advancing digital equity. I also want to recognize the Seattle Channel as our longtime media partner and Town Hall as our nonprofit program partner. Looking ahead, I hope you can join us on Friday, April 2nd, for our final program in a series about housing and homelessness and the crisis surrounding that in our community. And we're gonna have a conversation with elected officials who are leading this work. Then on Wednesday, May 5th, Civic Cocktail returns with a discussion about the future of downtown Seattle. We're gonna have Bob Donegan, the president of Ivers, and Brian Surratt, vice president of real estate development and community relations for Alexandria Real Estate. And he's also the former director of the city of Seattle's Office of Economic Development. Visit our website or social media for more details. In a few minutes, you can be part of the Civic Cocktail Conversation by submitting a question in the chat box. Please share yours early, keep it short, and direct it toward one of the speakers so we can try to incorporate it. Also, near the end of this program, we're gonna continue the live stream for about 10 minutes so we can focus on more of your questions with our guests. As always, we're committed to ensuring this is a civil, thoughtful exchange of ideas. For event-based nonprofits like Seattle City Club and Town Hall, this past year has been very difficult financially. So please consider making a gift to help us continue to produce programs like this. During and after the program, you can donate online or text. Just text the word CIVICS to the number 44321. Whatever you give is deeply appreciated by our organization. So thanks again for giving. Guess what? It's time to lean into this civic cocktail conversation with our guests and our host, journalist Joni Balter. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Civic Cocktail. I'm Joni Balter, and we have two of the top members of the U.S. House here tonight, both Democrats and both from our Washington Cong congressional delegation. Big thanks for joining us to U.S. Representative Pramila Jayapal of Washington's 7th Congressional District. She's the chair of the Progressive Caucus in the U.S. House, 91 members strong. Hearty welcome as well to U.S. Representative Susan Del Bene from Washington's 1st Congressional District. She is now chair of the New Democrat Coalition, moderates in the House, 94 members. Together, these women lead a big chunk of the Democrats' narrow House majority. Congresswoman Del Bene, let's start with you and the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan. You were number two in the House on the child tax credit. Why is this seemingly obscure item so essential and transformative? Um, thanks, Joni. And it's great to be here with everyone and with my colleague, Congresswoman Jayapal, and next door neighbor in parts of our district. Um, the American Rescue Plan is really transformative and a really important piece is the child tax credit. Um, and I'm honored to help uh, lead that effort. And it's transformative, it's transformative because it really is one of the biggest anti-poverty measures we've passed in Congress in a generation. What we do is we expand the child tax credit, which I know tax credits sound obscure and wonky, but um, right now many families are left behind because their families don't make enough money to earn the full credit. Tax credits offset 
tax burdens. And if you don't make enough money to have a tax burden, it doesn't help you very much. So what we've done in the American Rescue Plan is we've expanded the tax credit and we've made it refundable. What refundable means that if you don't make enough to get the credit to offset your taxes, we give you a check. We want those to be regular checks. It's up to $3,000 per child or $3,600 per child under the age of six um, to help families. 30% um, of Washington children's families are left out of the full benefit today. And by doing this policy, we are have huge um, impact on reducing child poverty in our country. It's in the American Rescue Plan for a year, this expansion of the child tax credit. We need to make it permanent. If we make it permanent, we will lift 4 million children across the country out of poverty. And those children in poverty primarily are Black and Hispanic children. They're children of single moms, children in rural areas. Um, so we can make a huge difference across our country, address many inequities. Um, so I'm looking forward to the ongoing effort to make sure that we make this policy permanent. Thank you. Uh, in this same legislation, uh, Representative Jayapal, you worked on a different feature, and it had to do with the income threshold. And you worked to make sure that that didn't um, decrease from earlier um, uh, stimulus packages. Why, why was that so important? Thanks, Joni. And it's also so great to be with everybody and with my colleague, Representative Del Bene. Um, this was related to the survival checks. So these are the $1,400 checks that everyone uh, is getting right now and will get if they qualify. And it, it was it's about money in people's pockets. And so what we said when there were efforts to try and reduce the eligibility thresholds or to basically make your income uh, you know, to say, well, we're going to limit the number of checks that can go out to people based on income. Our point was really that we were looking at income thresholds from 2019, not from 2020 when everybody lost their jobs and we had so much job loss in 2020. So if you base income threshold on 2019, you're going to miss a lot of people who lost all their income in 2020. But also, we really believe that with this crisis, that there were so many people that needed to have money in their pockets and that really were facing so many different crises that it was much better to um, be able to send checks out to a large number of people and then assume that the vast majority of them are going to be able to use that money and it'll, of course, flow right back into the economy. So it's a real boost for the economy as well. And we were very successful at keeping those survival checks at 1400 and making sure that uh, it, it was almost the same number of people that got the checks as got them last time. Of course, you'll remember that this is something we passed in uh, the last package as well. There was a $600 check. And in that um, package, we were also able to ensure that the checks went to mixed status families and that it was retroactive to the CARES Act so that the people who were able to now receive them with the December checks also could go back and get the CARES Act uh, checks if they, if they hadn't qualified for them back then. So this was a really important set of things that we were fighting for. Ultimately, it was about getting money in people's pockets, and we know how essential that is right now. Representative Jayapal, can you explain why, um, why you believe that this American Rescue Plan getting a, a lot of um, plaudits and, and praise will actually help Americans rebound uh, from the pandemic. You know, we're, we're getting so many kind of different messages. Cases are going up, but vaccines are going up. So I think people need here just, you know, a little bit of hope that these, these points connect, these dots yeah. connect. Yeah, absolutely. The American Rescue Plan is really the boldest, most progressive piece of legislation that I've had the privilege to vote on in my four years in the House. And um, the reason is because it is about money in people's pockets, shots in arms, getting kids back in schools, and making sure that our small businesses can thrive. We have had a year of devastation. People have been lining up around food banks to get food on their tables. They've been worrying about whether or not they're gonna be able to stay in their homes 
um, or whether they're going to get evicted. They've been worried about where their rental assistance is going to come from. They've been worried about how they're going to pay for their health insurance. There are so many pieces of what's happened over the last year that left too many families across our country feeling devastated and hopeless. With the American Rescue Plan, we not only are passing the child tax credit that Susan so beautifully described and has been a champion on. We're not only putting money in people's pockets, but we have more aid for restaurants and small businesses. We have uh, more subsidies and ability for people to qualify for the Affordable Care Act and make sure that they get Medicaid if they're eligible, be able to get their health insurance paid for. We have opportunities for black farmers. I mean, there's a lot of things in this bill that people aren't even necessarily focused on, but opportunities for black farmers to be able to keep their farms. A hundred million dollars in environmental justice grants that will go to communities that are dealing with bad air quality and water quality. Money for rental assistance. Um, the eviction moratorium is extended. There's so many different pieces of this that are about saying to the American people that government is here to help you. The help is here. We've been saying help is on the way. Help is now here. We will crush this virus. We will get vaccines out and we will be able to finally start to rebuild our communities from the bottom up. Uh, Representative Del Bene, before um we delve into many more mega recovery efforts. I want to make sure tonight that we don't miss out on gun control. So a couple of senators have said that there's actually a chance for bipartisanship on expanded background checks. Uh, you know, Congress has been pretty gutless on this over the years. So I'm wondering, is anything really different? Well, we passed it in the House, um, so I'd say Congress is moving, and this is a priority. We we have our bill, our top priority bills, and um, making sure that we we have bipartisan background check legislation, and we close the Charleston loophole were top priorities, and we passed those in the House just recently, um, and with bipartisan support. Now, the we should have more bipartisan support in Congress because. Our communities have strong bipartisan support across the country. I think 90% of Americans want to see background checks and they want to see them work. Um, we, we have had background checks in the past when you put loopholes in place and make it so it's ineffective. We don't see the impact of that policy. So Congress said it is more partisan on this issue than our communities are. And, um, and so that's where I think there's an opportunity where members of is, Congress need the to listen to their community. Does the opportunity have anything to do with the fact that the NRA is sort of on its knees at the moment, financially at least? I think it's also that people are standing up, uh, making sure their voices are heard. This is, this is an issue that has impacted all of our communities across the country, right here in our state, um, everywhere, there's a story, a tragic story, um, and we can do more. We should do more. And that's what we've done in the House, and we're going to keep working to get that policy through the Senate and to the White House. So, Representative Jayapal, um, uh, one senator said that, you know, somehow if Republicans and Democrats could maybe work together on gun control, that could persuade Democrats not to try to get rid of the filibuster. What is your position on the filibuster? And do you believe that some sort of cooperation like that might actually uh, make Democrats back off, the ones that want to go after the filibuster? Now, of course, this is in the Senate, but I, I, I know you have an opinion on those. <laughs> <laughs> you have an opinion on it. And it is that the filibuster is a, a legacy of Jim Crow laws. It was put in place by white Southern segregationists to stop progress on civil rights, and uh, it has been used to essentially give power to the minority, in this case, to Mitch McConnell, and to block all kinds of populist, popular legislation that has bipartisan agreement across the country, um, and yet the minority can simply block that legislation from coming through. And so I think it's really gridlocked us but it also, I, I think it's important for people to know the racist history of the filibuster and why it was put into place and how it's been used. So if we are going to pass any of the bills that we have passed in the House as Democrats, um, if we are going to pass them in the Senate, we are going to have to reform or eliminate the filibuster 
or we're going to have to override the parliamentarian, overrule the parliamentarian. But we should be clear that we twist ourselves into all kinds of procedural pretzels with the parliamentarian, who is a, a good person but unelected, um, offering an advisory opinion. But it's because of the deeper problem of the filibuster, which is not, uh, it does not, uh, you know, create deliberation and debate in the Senate. And anybody who wants to look at this should read Adam Gentleson's book, Kill Switch, which really goes into some detail. He worked in the Senate for uh, former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid and really goes through both the history and the effect of how broken the Senate is because of the filibuster. Representative Del Bene, moderates not so quick on getting rid of the filibuster? I think there's been, well, first of all, on the House where we have a slim majority too, this has been a lot of focus on making sure we're getting legislation across the finish line, um, important legislation like relief, like background checks, um, as you're talking about, and voting rights. Um, Pramila talked about the impact that uh, the filibuster has on moving issues of civil rights. And you know, one area that folks have talked a lot about and there's been a lot of agreement on is making sure that we are able to protect people's voting rights across the country. You've seen these attacks from Georgia. I mean, it's not even subtle. Just saying you can't give someone a bottle of water while they're standing in line um, pretty much highlights to the extent that folks will go. So we passed legislation, the For the People Act. Um, this is a broad legislation to help make sure that people's voices can be heard. They have access to the ballot, um, looks at issues of campaign finance reform and redistricting. And we also have the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Um, all of these are important to make sure people's voices can be heard. Um, I think that's a great example of a place where we should, Republicans decided they didn't need the filibuster if it came to Supreme Court justices. Um, I think it's important when we look at an issue like civil rights, like the For the People Act or John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Those are great examples of things um, where the filibuster shouldn't apply. And Joni, I'll just add quickly okay. to that and say that um, we have a letter going circulating right now with New Dems and progressives I on the letter to reform or eliminate the filibuster. So I do think that there's there's a lot of agreement across the caucus. Wow, so uh, teamwork there with the with the two different groups. Um, um, Representative Del Bene, you know, Democrats are doing a lot of a lot of big projects really quickly. Uh, maybe a lot of maybe political insiders know this. A lot of other people may not know, but you know, sometimes the party in power doesn't do so well uh, at the next congressional election. So, is this sort of rapid strike part of the strategy? One big project. At, one big project and program after the next. Well, you know, if I look across my district and my district was designed to be a purple district, if there's one thing that I hear from folks, it's that they want governance to work. They don't want to, they want us to make sure that we're there with legislation like the American Rescue Plan, that we're addressing issues and that policy's moving. And so absolutely, one of the most important things we can do is to make sure that governance is working, that we're moving legislation, that we're addressing problems. Um, and so I actually think that's the strongest statement we can make to our communities is talk about what we did. So yes, um, so in, fast, the new Dem, right? in the New Dem Coalition, um, we have a lot of folks where the, the reason we have a majority in the House, um, people in purple districts, um, those seats are the targets when folks are trying to flip the House. and. Um, they want to go back to their constituents and talk about what they did. And so we're very focused. It's two years we get um, in the House, um, so it's important. And we have great needs across our country, not just from the pandemic, but long term going forward. And we want to make sure that we are getting things done for the American people. Representative Jayapal, um, happy infrastructure week, for real. Um, this week, the president announced a giant infrastructure and jobs bill. At first, I thought maybe the West Seattle Bridge was in there, but I discovered that um, it, it, essentially the funding for that is is already in place. So what are some of the um, best projects for the Seattle area? Now, nothing's actually in there at this minute, but that, that will be recommended. 
Well, I was just at the West Seattle Bridge today, going under the bridge and climbing Did you down fix it? ladders and and were checking you able to out. fix it on the ladder? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't fix it today, Joni, but yeah. give, give, give us a little bit of time. We're going to get it done. They are working so hard on it. Um, but this look, this infrastructure package is really, really important for our country. And four years ago, in in 2017 the Progressive Caucus introduced a resolution for a $2 trillion green infrastructure package. And uh, I'll tell you that many, many of the components are in there. Now we do believe that there's room to even increase the amount of spending on infrastructure because we've had four years of rollbacks and inaction or worse than that, you know, bad action on climate. Do you, do you have a number in mind? Um, um, Joe well, Biden says 2.3 trillion. What what number do you have in he's mind? He's got 2.3 trillion, but then there's also another package and we would actually like to see the two combined because oh. when you think about a road being the thing that allows somebody to go to work, right? To go to their job um, and why it's so important. I think of also childcare or paid family leave as being just as important to get people back to work, especially all the women who have lost their jobs um, in disproportionate numbers over the last year. So if you look at the whole package, it would be great to see a significantly larger number than the three to four trillion that President Biden is talking about, because this is a once, we agree with him, this is a once in a generation uh, investment in our communities, in community college, in healthcare, in uh, infrastructure, in tackling the climate crisis that's before us. But we're really thrilled with the pieces that are in there. Some things that I think people will really appreciate is money for rebuilding schools, money for housing. This is a huge issue in our region. Um, Making sure that 40% of these investments uh, for for climate change, go into frontline communities, environmental justice. This is a very big piece that was a big priority for us uh, over the last year. So there'll be a lot in here for Seattle, for Washington State, and for our region to really address um, all of the pieces of transit, roads, bridges, schools, broadwind, you name it. Is, is there a specific project in Seattle that you, Representative Jayapal, think you know, must be done as part of this package? Can I say the West Seattle Bridge? You know, we, we have- They have the funding. Back. They already have the funding. Well, actually, no, they, they still need quite a bit, but yes, they're in line for it. And we're, we're advocating for different pieces of that funding, but um, there are so many roads and bridges across the Magnolia Bridge um, as well. But you may have seen the article recently about in the Seattle Times, I think about the number of bridges that need investment because we've gone so long without Ballard Bridge is, is, is exactly. troubled. Yes, exactly. Uh, Representative Del Bene, the crunch point on this is going to come for um, how much of it we pay for and how we pay for it. Joe Biden has uh, recommended for part of the payment uh, corporate tax increases from 21% to 28%. Uh, I'm wondering what the moderates will think of that. We know that the Republicans at least quickly out of the gate, we're not happy with a corporate tax increase. So first, let me say, just because I want to get in on infrastructure and remind folks that we have a big area and uh, um, there are big projects like uh, US2 Trestle between Everett and Lake Stevens. We've got um, just so many roads where um, there have been issues with flooding or uh, et cetera that need to be, or roads that need to be expanded, transit, multimodal issues. So since my the footprint of my district is quite large, I wanna remind folks we've got a lot of rural areas and other parts of the state that also um, are st- struggling with infrastructure. The Skagit Bridge, when it collapsed right up in Skagit County was an example of how important is we invest in infrastructure? So just wanted to quickly throw that in there. But on oh, terms totally of fair, yeah. in terms of what we are um, have to look at um, in terms of the president's proposal, um, I voted against the Republican tax bill. Um, it went in absolutely the wrong direction. It was about helping the biggest corporations and the wealthiest among us. Um, And our colleagues voted against it too. So this is a place where, in fact, most corporations, to be clear, um, President Obama had proposed um, lowering the corporate tax rate to 28%. 
Um, I think most corporations, no one ever thought they would go down to 21. I don't think that was even what a lot of folks have been asking for. So um, in the Republican bill, it went down much further than anyone anticipated. Um, and so absolutely, we need to address that. Um, and I would also say that we have to look broadly at all of the loopholes and incentives that are out there. I mean, the tax system is very complicated, but um, there are lots of opportunities for tax avoidance or, or programs that are in place to reduce tax taxes um, that don't make sense anymore. Um, and we never change that. So we have to look at that comprehensively. And there, we also have underfunded the IRS. Um, enforcement uh, has really declined. There have been a lot written about the, the the lack of enforcement means that folks are getting away with not paying the taxes that they should pay. And those are folks who large companies, um, wealthy folks who have the ability, tax planners and others who can help find ways to um, reduce their tax burden or, um, or without auditors and others who can check, um, never held accountable. So we need to make that investment too, because that's a, a significant amount of money um, that would make a difference across our communities. Well, the president only named one company that he thought was not, um, and I'm sure he has more on his list, but he only named one company that wasn't really paying enough tax, and that was um, Seattle-based Amazon. So I'm sure that was noticed by a few folks. Uh, Representative Jai Paul, I wanted to ask you, uh, this package, you know, if there's gonna be big disagreement on the method for paying for it, um, might have to be another one with, that passes with no uh, Republican support. Is that a good idea? You know, Joe Biden ran on, he's gonna consult and try to bring along Republicans. Uh, would you support this uh, going forward uh, without Republican support? Well, I welcome Republicans that understand how desperately needed a big, bold infrastructure investment is into their communities. But I will tell you, Joni, that I'm, uh, you know, I, I just watched the American Rescue Plan go through with not a single Republican vote when 76% of Americans believed that it was the right thing to do and the necessary thing to do. So I'm not holding my breath that we're gonna suddenly get Republicans coming along, but if they do, I welcome it. I mean, I think it would be great if they did what their constituents wanted. I also just wanna well, say- Welcoming uh, it is different than saying you, you proceed with or without it. We're gonna proceed on this infrastructure plan whether or not Republicans come along, but we would love them to come along. The need is too urgent. We have bridges that are collapsing. We have schools that need rebuilding. We have lead pipes in our water systems. We desperately need an investment in, in transit, in electrification of the grid. We've got to take on climate change. There are too many things that need to be done that people want us to do. And so just like the American Rescue Plan, I think the American public is with us on this, and I hope that Republicans follow their constituents. But I wanted to say on the pay fors, you know, just in terms of revenue, one of the things I've really appreciated about President Biden and the administration is that they have consistently made the point that they are interested in these revenue raisers because they want to make the tax system more fair, not because they think that the package needs to be paid for, because we know that infrastructure from all the economists and all of the history, investments in infrastructure of the kind that we're talking about actually pays for itself. So I have appreciated the way the White House has made that distinction, that this is about making sure that we make the tax system more fair and great, it's raising revenue as well, which will pay for some of this, but we, we actually have uh, a real ability to pay for things right now, both because these are things that invest in themselves and because um, we will ultimately be in a situation where whatever we do now is, um, is, is, is so necessary and, and will lead us forward in all the ways that we want. Uh, Representative Del Bene, you know, President Biden's job approval numbers are, some, are north of 53% if you take the rolling um, average of those. One exception is the border. Uh, Republicans smell blood. We've already talked about the fact that, uh, you know, 
big, big election coming up before you can even imagine it would be upon you in 2022. Are, are, are Democrats in danger of losing the House in 2022 over the border? Uh, we need comprehensive immigration reform. I, this was an issue that was the first thing I heard from constituents when I first ran um, for Congress. And so this is my ninth year. And there are other members of Congress who predated me who had talked about immigration reform. We have a legislative crisis when it comes to immigration reform. We, and Congress needs to act for long sustainable change um, in immigration for durable policy, Congress needs to act. And yet we had um, the former administration that did everything to um, undermine our values, to treat immigrants horribly, um, to, to spread hate. Um, and now we have an opportunity to make sure we're living up to our values um, with, and understand the challenges that are being faced by folks um, from the southern border, both the violence, the impacts of climate on communities. So, um, so we have an important role to play. Um, we and members of Congress have an important role to play in addressing um, our immigration laws and making sure we address a system that's been broken for for so long. And so we passed the American Dream and Promise Act. Um, again, something bipartisan in terms of making sure that um, we address. Dreamers and and folks here up for t under TPS. We also passed the Farm Workforce Modernization Act um, to address farm workers. Um, so those were those were um, were important piece of legislation that I hope the Senate will move on. Again, to our earlier point, there is a huge opportunity for them to be able to do that. But we need broad reform, um, and broad reform is what's being worked on with the U.S. Citizenship Act, and um, and so. This is a this is a critical issue for everyone in our country. So we'll come back to this topic, but I have an audience question for both of you from T. Farrell, asking, "What do you what do you think is the biggest threat to democracy in the U.S. right now?" So, Representative Jayapal, what's bothering I, you about that? The biggest threat is um, the the assault on voting rights. Uh, I really believe that that is. Uh, it is stunning to see all the attempts and successful attempts in some states to limit the ability of people to vote. We, of course, in Washington State, I'm so proud, have been continuing to do things that expanded. I, I helped write the bill for automatic voter registration when I was in the Senate. It passed after I left. But, um, you know, that is what we should be investing in. Instead, we're seeing these assaults, particularly on Black, Brown, Indigenous voters. And we are seeing that sort of dovetail with the influence of money in politics and uh, a consolidation of, you know, special interest power versus people's power. And so to me, those two things are tied together. That's why HR1 that Susan mentioned earlier is so important. That's the For the People Act. And that is both about getting money out of politics and bringing transparency and accountability to government. And it's also about ensuring that people have the right to vote and that we make it easier for people to vote, not harder. And meanwhile, Republicans don't seem to understand that they had record turnout as well in this last election. And these methods can help everybody, Republicans, Democrats and independents to come out and vote. And yet they're opposing them and worse, they are actively promoting racist laws that stop particularly voters of color from voting. Both Susan and I have gone on the civil rights pilgrimage with the late John Lewis. And um, I can tell you that to see what's happening in Georgia today is, uh, is just stunning and such an incredible movement backwards from what we thought we had achieved. So to me, that's the biggest threat. And, and Representative Del Benny, I agree. Is the um, biggest threat. I agree with Pramila. Um, I over here, which you cannot see, I have a picture on my wall of Martin Luther King and John Lewis um, on the march from Selma to Montgomery. I was born in Selma, Alabama. This is um, a, you know, one of the great honors for me in serving in Congress was serving with and getting to know John Lewis. Um, and um, we had a little, we had the Selma caucus, myself, Terry Sewell, who represents Selma and John Lewis. That's 
people fought so hard for this it's a very important right because it's so core to our democracy. It's so core to equality and making sure that um, people's voices are heard. And so I agree that's the number one. I just also would say the other issue that we have to address that's key is the rise of disinformation, um, the impact that has had across the country um, and frankly around the world. Um, people need, we need to, to understand the impact that's had on our communities. And, um, and that's also been a threat to democracy. And we've had folks actively try to undermine our democracy and our elections. And, um, and part of that has been through attacks through using technology. So um, jumping to another topic, because I, I don't want to run out of time before we get to health care. So essentially progressives on health care would like Medicare for all. Uh, Susan Del Bene, your caucus is a little bit more for something uh, more like a public option that um, that gives people more possibilities for paying for their health care. Can you explain uh, why yours is better, your idea is better? Well, I think the first thing that folks want to do is stabilize the Affordable Care Act um, and kind of undo a lot of the harm that was done by the past administration in their ongoing tax on people's access to health care. Um, but I think there's a shared goal that we all have, which is because we believe health care is a right that people should have universal affordable coverage. And the Affordable Care Act definitely helped 20 million Americans help get them access to health care coverage. We have more to do. Um, and so the first thing um, moving forward is to strengthen the Affordable Care Act. And I do support a public option. I think that it we help make sure that everyone has coverage in our country. Um, people have choice and I think that people will choose the option that is best for them and by having a public option there um, I think it brings that competition into market and will give people the ability to um, to make that decision themselves and address the kind of the politics that have really undermined access to affordable health care right now um, but this is a this has got we I think all are together in trying to figure out how we move the ball forward because um, the pandemic has highlighted disparities that were there before. Um, there was a lot of effort to undermine even basic things like coverage for pre-existing conditions from the last administration. So it's critical right now that we um, move forward, strengthen the Affordable Care Act and continue to make sure that everyone has affordable quality coverage. Representative Jayapal, um, Senator Bernie Sanders is floating the idea um, it's not a Medicare for all, it's a Medicare eligibility age reduction to either 55 or 60. Would that do it uh, f for you or are you holding out for uh, Medicare for all? Well, two things, Joni. I agree with um, Susan that we all share the goal of covering everybody and that we all understand the Affordable Care Act was a big step forward. But I will just say that it is really clear to me and to 115 members of Congress and the Democratic Caucus that signed on as original co-sponsors to my Medicare for All Act that we just introduced, including 15 committee chairs of very powerful committees, that um, our healthcare system is broken. It was broken before COVID. Um, and the reality is we've structured it to be a for-profit healthcare system that puts profits over patients. And when you have that, any changes you try to make may help get some people insured for sure, but it is not going to get everybody insured. And what happens when we don't have everybody insured? Let's just take the COVID pandemic. What you saw is 87 million people who were uninsured or underinsured even before the pandemic hit. When the pandemic hit, you had two things going on. One, you had all of these people who had not been able to get health care and take care of their health care needs, largely people who were poor, black, brown, disproportionately without health care. And they then became the most susceptible and vulnerable to uh, the pandemic. And that is why recent, a recent study just came out showing that 42% of the people who got infected with COVID were tied to a lack, it was tied to a lack of health insurance. 
30% of the people who died was tied to a lack of health insurance. And so our belief is that you really have to have a single payer healthcare system where you have lots of providers that are still the same providers you're seeing today, but you don't have to deal with for-profit insurance companies for the basic comprehensive coverage that you get. If there are other things that you wanna get, private insurance companies are willing and happy to provide that, that's great. But the core set of comprehensive coverage should be provided through a government insurance program and the same network of providers so that we don't limit choice by saying you can only participate in this plan. You can't see these providers. These providers are out of network and you're gonna get a big surprise bill for it. So um, that I think is really important. And then the quick second point I would make is that we've had experts come in from Australia. In fact, there was a Washington Post piece about why Australia was so successful, and it was partly because of their single payer system. Taiwan, Korea, all these places that had single payer systems that did so much better because they were able to quickly and nimbly make sure everyone got tested and got the treatments that they needed during the pandemic. Uh, Representative Del Bene, I, I wanted to ask you about, you know, we've been talking tonight about. Um, the American Rescue Plan, the Infrastructure and Jobs Plan, and even a companion uh, bill to, to the Infrastructure and Jobs Plan. My question for you is, do you think folks will get something like, you know, fatigue from all this? Do you think the energy will still be there in a month when that second uh, proposal is supposed to come out uh, to support more support for Americans? Some, many people are still struggling, as you've, as you've both been saying this evening. So, I mean, that's why it's important that we continue to move legislation and get resources to our communities, that we make the, the short, address short-term needs, but also make the bold investments which the president has put forward in the in investing in the long term for our country um, investments in infrastructure and infrastructure broadly um, really impact really lay the foundation for uh, a strong economy for for the opportunities for um, folks throughout our communities in the future um, and so if we don't do that we're going to continue to see struggles and, and the ongoing disparities that we've seen across the country even post pandemic, um, communities that are struggling today will continue to struggle. Um, so when we talk about making sure, for example, that everyone has broadband, look, I represent one of the biggest technology hubs um, on the globe um, combined, I think between uh, you know, Congresswoman Jayapal and myself, yet you can drive an hour away for where I am now in King County and be in a part of my district where there's not rural broadband or even good cell service. Um, that's happening right here in our communities. That disparity didn't just start. It's been there for a long time, but it means those kids don't have the same access to learning. People can't telework. Um, those communities are impacted again um, in a great way. And if we wanna see long-term opportunity, we have to address those. These aren't issues that are new, um, but they have been waiting for bold action, and we have the opportunity now, especially as people see even in more stark terms what's happened, we have the opportunity to take that bold action. And that's what we're doing. Um, and that's why this is so important in all areas, in infrastructure, for families, child care, um, making sure that we have, in fact, the care economy that the president talks about in the American Jobs uh, Plan to make sure that, you know, long-term care workers and others are there. Those are all pieces um, that are a critical need to our communities and to families and have been and will be going forward. And so I do think it's important. And I do think that's um, what, in terms of governance working, that's part of governance working for our communities. So I'm running out of time here, but I do wanna get in this one audience question to you, uh, Representative Jayapal. What is the party doing to encourage women, people of color, and those from underrepresented communities to run for office? Well, we, um, you know, I think there's a whole bunch of us who are women and folks of color who are really trying to mentor and bring, uh, bring on people that are from our specific communities to, 
to, um, to run for office. And so that's individual work, but also the party has been investing more with, with a lot of us pushing for this to have more engagement with um, our communities of color, to be out there on social media and also in the communities with language specific materials, talking to people about what we're doing, getting people interested and feeling like they're engaged. And then ultimately, when people see Vice President Kamala Harris as the first Black woman and first South Asian American uh, to hold that office, then they too get inspired. And I know that that is true now. You know, I was the first person of color that Democrats in Washington sent to Congress. Now we've got Marilyn Strickland as well. And I think we will continue to increase the ranks of those of us that serve and represent diverse communities. Uh, Representative Jayapal, running out of time, but I really want to ask you this. Uh, you were an early and enthusiastic supporter of Senator Bernie Sanders for president. You endorsed Joe Biden last April. How has Joe Biden surprised you, if he has surprised you? Well, I think that President Joe Biden is in a really different place than where candidate Joe Biden was when he first started. Um, we didn't have all of the effects of the pandemic yet. Uh, we hadn't seen the movements, the progressive movements in Georgia with black women turning out to vote in Georgia or the immigrant rights movement that 10 years ago when I went and protested SB 1070, we were talking about building uh, a new voting base and turning Arizona blue. And both parties looked at us like we were crazy, but that happened. We turned Arizona blue. We had young people. We had all these folks. And I think that that has shifted Joe Biden both in terms of the urgency and the crisis of what we face and in terms of recognizing that his win and our historic wins in the Senate and the House were in large part because of a very progressive base that turned out. So he's been a great champion so far, really bold and progressive on, on what he's coming out with. And it's been a I real pleasure to work with him. I appreciate that. We have been catching up with uh, representatives Pramila Jayapal and Susan Del Bene, fascinating conversation about polit political differences and collaboration among two Democratic factions. Thank you both so much for your time. Civic Cocktail returns in May with a look at downtown Seattle. Quite simply, we want to know how to rebuild what was once one of the most successful downtowns in the country. Thank you for joining us and good night. And we're back on the Civic Cocktail live stream to take more audience questions for our guests, Representatives Jayapal and Del Benny. Oh, and we have an audience uh, question from Amanda. What can Seattle residents do to support? We've been talking a lot about voting rights. What can Seattle residents do? They probably feel far from some of these arguments. Uh, Representative Del Benny. Um, well, first of all, uh, we all get to have a voice and participate in our democracy. And so we can support that effort by being engaged and involved. Um, we also have proven, um, and we've done a great job here, we've been able to have real data to go against these arguments, for example, that vote by mail doesn't work. We had to, we were right here in Washington State being able to, to show folks that. Um, and, and so we have a role to play not only here at home, but also um, to work with others across the country to help fight for voting rights, just like the John Lewis's did. Um, they weren't just fighting for folks um, in one community, they were fighting for voting rights across the country and we all get to play a role in doing that. Uh, Representative Jayapal, uh, beyond health care, what are the biggest differences between your two caucuses? You folks have spent a lot of time. You have uh, regular gatherings on the phone with the governor. So you, you kind of know your differences. I'm sure you could outline those for us. Yeah, well, you know, the Progressive Caucus is 96 members strong. And I think we really share the same uh, end goals across the Democratic caucus. I think there are differences in how fast we wanna go or believe we can go, and also some of the strategies to get there. I think progressives are much more suspect of uh, just market strategies to get somewhere. We really believe in a much, uh, in a strong role for government. And because we represent 
a lot of folks of, you know, we come, many progressives come from very urban districts, a lot of young people, a lot of folks of color. Um, and we've been rooted in a lot of those issues over the years. Um, I think that particular disparity around race um, and class is very, very strong for progressives. Um, but I really do think that we also believe that um, we need to we need to fix things quickly. And I, I actually think the pandemic has taken away many differences that may have existed before. I feel like we're much more in the same place um, as an entire Democratic caucus and even with the president than we have been in a long time. And that makes me very happy because I think we all feel the urgency that we need to move forward with. But fiscal policy, I think, can be can be different um, sometimes within the within the within progressives and others. So Representative Del Bene uh, Peg has a question, and it's it goes right back to that infrastructure bill. The point being that industries and corporations, you know, they benefit from infrastructure investments and improvements, but then end up opposing the idea that they would pay for them. Are they benefiting more than they they're paid for? Well, I think you know the one. This is, I think everyone understands that infrastructure generally. And I apologize, the sun out here <laughs> is actually shining and has created a strange, uh, strange view Wait, here. Sun I can't get out. I have the I have the shades down, but the sun is still shining. So we should all be happy about that. But um, uh, the one it is foundational. For, for our economy, infrastructure. And I mean infrastructure across so many things, broadband, surface transportation, um, housing, all of this is critically important, um, energy and water. And so, yes, um, I think that there is a, a big benefit to everyone when we make these investments. We also know that the tax code is one way where we help make sure that those are investments are easily sh are equally shared. And that's a place where we absolutely went in the wrong direction um, when Republicans uh, passed their bill. And that's something that we want to address. And that's something that the president um, raised when he brought up the American Jobs Plan um, in terms of his his recommendations to change the corporate rate. And so we do need to address that, but I think that's gonna be something we have to address through tax policy so that we have a tax policy that's fair and folks are pay paying their share, including large corporations and the wealthiest in our communities. So uh, Representative Jayapal, Amanda has a question for you and it's what do you think about Amazon requiring employees to return to the office? <laughs> Um, well, I think that, you know, companies are going to make different decisions, but the most important thing is that employees are safe. And I think that, uh, I think it's probably no secret that I've got a lot of differences with Amazon on how, uh, what, what some of their worker policies are, their anti-unionization activity. Um, and the, the fact that through this pandemic, while there have been some really wonderful things that Amazon has done, um, you know, we have not seen the protection of workers' safety and workers' rights um, and hazard pay at the levels that I think we should have had when you look at the, the amount of wealth that has been accumulated at the top. And so uh, I just would want, I, I, I don't know enough about what their policy is. I just think they have to be clear that workers have to be safe when they come back. That's the most important thing. And I, I hope they will. Well, sort of on a frivolous note on that, um, uh, I saw one employee tweeted that, you know, this was going to cut into his afternoon kayaking, and so he couldn't go back to work, I guess. Uh, and one more for um, from Jeff. Um, what are you doing in Congress to address our housing and homelessness crisis? Uh, Representative Del Bene, why don't you take that one? Um, thanks. Such an important question, and I'm glad this topic came up too because it is critical to um, to you know communities across the country, but definitely a huge issue for all of us here. And I want to highlight it's a huge issue in our urban areas, it's in our rural areas, in our tribal communities. Um, we prior to the pandemic, many 11 million Americans were rent burdened, paying you know large 
part of their earnings to pay for housing. Um, so we've had an affordable housing crisis. And um, one thing in particular that we can do address it is to help make sure we address the inventory issue. There's not enough and I, there's not enough everywhere. Um, so I have led the effort in the house on, on the expansion of the low income housing tax credit. Um, we actually got a legislation passed as part of a legislation that went through in December of last year to that will help many, many more projects get financed and built um, because the tax credit value was decreasing by so much. So we stabilized that. Um, and then we are, again, working to, um, to address is issues that have prevented uh, more projects from being developed. Um, and so Senator Cantwell and I are leading legislation again this year to help address um, the affordable housing uh, tax credit, um, the opportunities that we have to really address the inventory issue. That's not the only issue, but that's one important issue that's because our area has grown so much. We've displaced, I, you know, in our state, um, Congresswoman Jayapal's district, my district have been the fastest growing in our state and um, we haven't kept up. And so, so many people have been displaced um, or it, um, it's so expensive. So one big thing we need to do is look at that and that's a long-term effort. And that's why um, addressing the, uh, the low-income housing tax credit is critically important to make sure we have the investment in that long-term development of affordable housing. So Representative Jayapal, some people say, you know, moderates have more power uh, and progressives get more of the spotlight. What do you think of that? <laughs> I knew you'd laugh. I knew you'd laugh. <laughs> I just think that's funny. Um, you know, I just think that the progressive movement has continued to to grow. I, I don't think about it as a comparison with moderates. I just think about what we've been able to achieve in really moving forward bold ideas, things like a $15 minimum wage, which I was on the committee um, that helped, you know, put that proposal together, made Seattle the first major city in the country to pass 15. Back then, we were called radical. And guess what? Today, President Joe Biden is pushing a $15 minimum wage, and we've passed it through the House um, already. And so when you look at ideas like that, like climate change and the movement for climate justice, um, and all of the ways in which progressive populist policies have really made it into the center fold of uh, where we are, but even ideas like um, taking on income and wealth inequality. You know, today, Elizabeth Warren and I have a proposal for a wealth tax that is on this, you know, ultra millionaires and billionaires. If you make 50 million or over, you would pay two cents on every dollar or three cents on every dollar if you make it to a billion. I bet people right now think that's not possible. I can tell you, Joni, that that is going to become a feature of what we push for in a couple of years. That's just the nature of progressivism is that we are almost always uh, first to what I consider uh, the best and most just idea. And then it takes other people a little while to catch up with us, but we're all in this together. We're in the same boat together and we're working for the people together. So we're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up right there. We're gonna thank you both so much for your time. What a, what a fun evening and, and so much information. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you all so much and good night.